Chris Godina, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday here at noon, and then I post it up to Facebook. Uh, this video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up, click on that, and it will have all of the therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other damn therapist for that matter. Boom, shuckalaka done. Okay, good. That's out of the way. So I want to say a great big, huge thank you to everyone who turned out in California. And I'm sorry I had to cut this trip short. It was raining like great. Good Lord. Hello, Buenos Aires. Wow. Cool. Um, so and I love you guys too. Um, so it was raining like crazy. We get to San Diego and I'm, I'm doing the lecture and I'm watching out the window and I can see the palm trees doing this and then back and then this and then back. And I'm like, great. Okay, it's driving this. Fabulous. So, um, so anyway, we drove up from there to Irvine and, and a big thank you to the people in San Diego, big thank you to the people in Irvine that showed up in this rotten weather that we had. And it was great because I was able to get, and also to Santa Monica, because we drove up in that and people showed up and I was very pleased. And what I do when I go to these different cities is I get everybody to exchange emails and stuff because I'm trying to set up your tribe. I'm trying to set up people that you can talk to who have been there, done that, and you guys can be a support for each other. So that's my evil plan. Hi, Atlanta. That's my evil plan when I go on these tours is to try to get as many people um, South Africa. Holy, what time is it over there? Um what was I saying? Squirrel. Um, that's what I try to do when I go on these tours is get people to be the tribes and to be there for each other. So um, that's one of the benefits is com of coming to one of these lectures is that's what I do. Um, we are going to be releasing more information on the Let's Cruise with Chris Godinas on Monday morning. Um, we're going to be talking about what we'll be doing, accommodation, onboard pricing. And um, so we're looking into also running a um, monitored uh, administered chat people can get together and talk and have it safe. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Um, so um, we're going to be doing that. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone in Southern California. It was awesome. It was so nice to meet all you guys. It was awesome to see you and awesome to see you guys become your own support for each other. So that was way, way cool. Um, okay. What was I thinking? Oh, so I have a new website. <laughs> it's uh, www.chriscodinez.com. That's where we're going to put all of the, the stuff there. So there's one central place that you can go. You can always still go to Eventbrite and look up to see where I am going to be. I do have new tour dates because, um, oh, this is what I was going to tell you. So it was raining like crazy and it was bad weather and it was mudslides and everything. And my sister lives in Santa Barbara and she sent me a text and she was like, for the love of God, do not drive up here. There's evacuations going on. There's mudslides. I don't think it's safe. So I'm sorry, but when my big sister says don't come up, that's when I listen. So anyway, so I didn't come up. And then friends in Northern California were like, oh, look, it's snowing down to the valley floor. And I'm like, I'm a little phoenix girl i don't drive in snow i don't do mm -mm, nope i let my husband do that he's 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 a mountain man he drives in the snow i'm 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 a low lowlander i don't so that's what i called it so anyway i apologize to everybody in northern california but here are the new dates peoples so um if you are a member of Minsa, I will be I will be talking about my book you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him cha cha where the heck did it go ha there at the Mensa annual gathering in Phoenix at the Sheraton on July 4th at 2.30 PM. You don't have to be a member of Mensa. You do have to sign up for it. Um, so anyway, there is that, that is not my gig at all. This is through Mensa. So if you're interested, go look it up on, um, uh, annual gathering 2019 Mensa Phoenix, and it will have all the information there. Uh, on July 6th, I will be doing Santa Barbara because I, God damn it. I'm going to get up there if it, freaking is the last thing I do and it hopefully it won't be hmm, knock wood anyway um so uh July 6th will be Santa Barbara so this will be going up on Eventbrite if we don't have it up today we'll get it up soon um August 3rd I will be back in Anaheim why because I'm going to Disneyland god damn it so I'm going with my girlfriend Andrea so before I go to Disneyland with Andrea I'm going to do another lecture in Anaheim since I'm going to be there anyway August 31st and September 1st thinking of San Jose and San Francisco so so there's there were people in San Jose and San Francisco that wanted to see me as well. So I will reschedule it for August 31st and September 1st. So that will also be up on 
Eventbrite. Uh, September 28th and 29th, we are going to do another part in the Bay Area, maybe Oakland, Berkeley, something around there, and then Sacramento. So trying to hit all of the places that I didn't get a chance to go to because of the stupid weather. So, all right. So just go check Eventbrite. I don't think it's up quite yet because Chris and I were just talking about it this morning and trying to figure out dates, times, and figuring it out. Then we're going to go to uh, Texas in October. That's the evil plan. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. Did I get everything? Dear God. All right. So today I want to talk about dysfunctional families and what bad habits we have learned from them. So when we come out of a dysfunctional family, we're going to have a ton of fleas, like a ton of fleas. So, and we will have learned things that are not necessarily helpful. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is the hows and the whys. So if we've got a family that is extremely codependent, so one member of the caregivers is addicted, absentee, um, abusive, mental illness, you know, something like that. And the other member is very codependent. We very quickly start identifying with the codependent one and we start looking at how they caretake. And so we then become caretakers. This is where, this is how codependence happens guys is we have a family member that is um, uh, out of it in some way, shape or form, either they're abusive or they're addicted or they're mentally ill or they're physically, you know, disabled or something. And we watch how the other member takes care of and we start picking up those habits of constantly caretaking, constantly caretaking, constantly caretaking. So that is where codependency comes from is we learn it. It's a learned behavior. All of this stuff is learned behavior. So here's the good news. If it's learned, it can be unlearned and it can be replaced with healthy behavior. So codependency is a learned behavior. So in other words, you watch somebody who's in a dysfunctional relationship, which looks like this, right? So here's, here's the person that they're looking to for their self-esteem. Here's this person. If this person goes away, this person goes kathunk. So you don't want that. So coming out of a dysfunctional family where there is codependency, you absolutely want to be working on the disease to please with Harriet Breaker by Harriet Breaker and or Melanie Beattie's uh, Codependent No More, Beyond Codependent No More. There's a whole bunch of breaking free of codependent behavior books. And I just mentioned the ones that I have read recently. So if you don't like those two, go find one that works for you because not every book is for everybody, just like not every therapist is for everybody. So go find a book on codependency that works for you that's going to help you break that habit. So what happens with kids that are looking at codependent families is that we tend to mimic the behavior and we keep taking care of, and then we go out in the world and we find somebody to take care of. And that's how we get our self-esteem. So the other book you're going to want to get is The Self-Esteem Workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. You're going to want to do mirror work. You're going to want to give yourself permission to not have to caretake everybody and their dog in order for you to feel okay. The word no is your friend. You're going to use it. You're going to use it well. You're going to use it widely and you're going to use a lot and not feel guilty about it. So what I hear from a lot of people is that that sense of obligation, like, oh, I have to take care of this person. Oh, I feel guilty if I don't take care of this person. Take a deep breath. Healthy relationships do not have fear obligation or guilt. We are in the relationship because it's happy, because it's it's already whole. We don't have to fix anybody and we enjoy being with them. We enjoy their company. We're not fixing them. We're not taking care of them. We're not caregiving them. We're not doing any of that. We're there because we want to be, not because we have to be. So that is what I want you guys to be aware of. Now, when we come out of, oh, the venue is up for New Orleans. I know I forgot something else. New Orleans will be March 23rd. Venue is up. I'm going to be there. It's going to be for three hours. So same thing. All right. Sorry. All right. The other thing that happens is, is when we have family and friends or family that are disordered. Okay. When someone is disordered, they have very black and white thinking. And unfortunately, we as kids, again, learn that black and white thinking. That does not mean we are disordered ourselves. It just means we've picked up fleas, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So when we have family that's disordered, their thinking is extremely rigid. That's how you know you're dealing with somebody who is disordered. They don't have flexibility. There is no 
gray area for them. It's all black or white, all nothing, good, bad, black, white. It's one side of the fence or the other. There's no in between. So it's really hard for us coming out of family with that kind of dysfunction to not have black and white thinking. It's learned. We learn black and white thinking. It's either good or bad, all or nothing. You know, it's a hundred percent or zero. It's full go or full stop. So that is learned behavior that we get from the disordered members of our family that were caregivers that then translates to us as adults, because we then have full go, full stop, full go, full stop, all nothing good, bad. And that translates into our relationships. So you couple that with codependency and, oh my God, we've got a recipe for disaster. So what's happening is, is that what you see with codependent targets of abuse is that they give their all to this abuser, like literally, like it's 125,000%, okay? And it's all, 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 all. And then when it stops, obviously it's nothing, <laughs> you know, and then the next one comes along and it's all. So in a healthy relationship, do you give your all? Well, yes, but not in an unhealthy way. In other words, you do not allow that blinder to be on that blinds you to the abuse or blinds you to issues or blinds you to whatever. In a dysfunctional family, notice how many blinders are on people. Notice how they sit there and they go, we don't see the pink elephant taking a crap in the corner of the living room. No, 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 that's not happening. I don't see it. It's not there. Well, guess what? That also is a learned behavior. So we then learn to not listen to our gut, to not see the pink elephant and to put blinders on and go, no, 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 no. I don't see. No, no, no. I don't see it. I don't No, Don't see it. Don't see it. You can't make me see it. I don't see it even though the abuse is like literally blatant and right in your face, you'll, you'll still be sitting there going, no, 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 no. It's not there. It's not there. I can fix this. I can work around this. I can make this better. So that's where the codependency and the disordered black and white thinking really affect us because then we get into these relationships and it's full go, full stop, full go, full stop. And that's not healthy either. So in a healthy relationship, there is moderation. There is balance. It's not just one person giving their all and the other one taking their all, okay? There's balance. It's a give and take. It's a flow. It, it ebbs and it flows. It ebbs and it flows, you know? It's a flow. But with dysfunction, there is none of that. And so we get stuck in this idealized thinking that we're being noble. And I hear this a lot from targets of abuse. I'm being noble if I stay with this person that nobody likes. What? <laughs> no, you're being abused. You're not being noble. You're being abused. But we get this thinking that if we are caregivers and that's what our identity is and that we're staying with this person because nobody likes them and everybody has shunned them because of their behavior, that somehow we're noble. And that is... <laughs> that is encouraged by the abuser. Absolutely. And it is encouraged by the disordered family as well. So, you know, if you find yourself living in that whole, I'm being noble by staying with this person who nobody likes and is abusing me, you are deluding yourself. No, you're being abused. You're not being noble. You're being abused. So healthy, normal relationships don't have the concept of nobility They don't because you don't need it because it's all common equal ground. It's, it's a, a fair and share give and take, and it's an ebb and a flow and it rocks back and forth and it's healthy and there's no fear, obligation, or guilt. And there's none of this sense of, Oh, I'm being noble. It's like, what the fuck? No, you're not. You're being abused. So that is something to watch out for when you are dating, you know, when you're in a relationship, if you find yourself thinking that Houston we got a problem. So it's, it's codependency. It's that, you know, I don't see the abuse. I don't want to see the abuse. You don't see the, but don't trust your gut. No, you don't see that. And this sense of, well, I'm being noble if I take care of this person. No, you're not, you're being abused and, and, and only you can stop it. That's the thing because abusers will never change. Abusers will always abuse. Given the option to not abuse or abuse, they will always abuse. So there is that. So when you get into a relationship, you want to make sure you have your codependency nailed the fuck down. Like seriously, like <laughs> nailed down tight. 
because otherwise you will find yourself doing more and more and more and more and more. And if you are with an abuser, they will continue to take more and more and more and more, and you'll find yourself exhausted in a healthy, normal relationship. It's exhilarating. It's fun. It's you feel energized after having spent time with the person. You feel good. You don't feel, you do not feel exhausted. You don't feel put out. You don't feel drained. You don't feel bad about yourself. You don't feel fear. You don't feel obligation and you don't feel guilt. If you feel any of those things, run. Do not walk to the nearest exit. It is not a healthy relationship. Does that make sense? So this is what happens to us, though, when we come out of dysfunctional families of origin, because they teach us how to be with another person. And especially if one parent or the other was the caregiver to the, the narcissist or the caregiver to the malignant borderline or whatever, we very quickly pick up those habits about how to be in a relationship. And that does us no good service because then we are just freaking groomed for an abuser to come, you know, abuse us. All right. So the other thing that happens is, and I made notes. Um, so how do you, how do you break that? How do you break the all or nothing thinking? So what it is, it's thought stopping again. So if you hear the words, I'm being noble, that's a huge red flag ginormous. Oh my God. Huge red flag. Why are you having to be normal? Hello, fear, obligation, guilt, Whoa, big red flag, <laughs> incorrect response. The other thing you have to do is thought stopping. So when you find yourself doing the all or nothing, good or bad, black or white, you're literally going to have to go stop. The world is a plethora of colors. I need to find the plethora. I need to come back to center. And you have to force yourself to see the world in more colors than just black or white. And that takes training. It takes mindfulness. It takes tuning in and listening to what are you telling yourself on a minute to minute basis? How are you viewing the world? Is it good, bad, all, nothing, black, white? Whoa, let's kind of come back to center here. Let's find some moderation in all things, you know, so that's, that's what we have to do. So it's thought stopping. So when we hear ourselves making those, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like those all inclusive statements, you know, like everything, everything's bad. Everything's bad. That's, that's, that's an extreme all or nothing, right? Everything's bad. You know, it's like, well, no, not everything is bad. There's a lot of bad. Yeah, for sure. But there's a lot of good too. And you have to kind of come back and go, okay, not everything is bad. You know, this might be bad right now. That might be bad right now, but this, 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 and this are all good. So you have to go back the other way. It's, it's, it's the swing of the pendulum. So, and what tends to happen and be aware of this is that when we come out of an abusive family, a dysfunctional family, when we start working on the codependency and we start working on everything else, the pendulum is going to swing way back in the opposite direction. Okay. Because we're, we've never had permission to take care of ourselves before. So some people, it starts swinging this way and they go, Oh my God, I'm being selfish. I'm being this, I'm being that. Oh my God, I'm a terrible, awful, horrible person for taking care of myself. Stop. Take a deep breath. It's okay to take care of you. And self-care is doing the mirror work, looking in the mirror and saying, hi, good to see you. Have a good day. I give you permission to like yourself. I give you permission to do something nice for yourself. Something small like that. And then notice what pops up. And if this thing says anything other than good job, I love you, keep going, you tell it to shut the fuck up. Why? Because you say so. You're the boss of it. I have a right to take care of myself period, because I say so. Does that make sense? So that's how you start working on that. So that is a very common issue that happens in people coming out of dysfunctional families who have been in a series of abusive relationships. Abusers look for people who are codependent. They look for people who are empathic and they start playing on the guilt and telling us that it's not okay to take care of ourselves. It's not okay for us to do nice things for ourselves. How dare you? Well, if you did that, I want that too. You know, if you spend X amount of money on you, I want double. You know, this is what they do. This is just what abusers do. So to start working on that all or nothing, good or bad, black or white thinking, you have to become aware of it. 
And you have to call it for what it is. And you have to start working on the codependency so that you're not doing this, so that your relationships are self-esteem based. And when you come together with somebody, you know, you kind of weeble wobble. And if one person goes away, you don't go kathunk. You kind of go weeble wobble. This sucks. But then you're fine. So that's what you want. So that's that's self-esteem that is working on the codependency. And then the thoughts. You've got to get back to the middle. You've got to stop going all the way over here or all the way over there. Does that make sense? So it's thought stopping and it's, it's journaling. It's like, why am I thinking this? Why am I feeling this? Who taught me that it wasn't okay for me to take care of myself? Who taught me that I had to caretake everybody else and put myself last? Who taught me that? And then you journal it out and burn it. Let it go. All right. There is that boundaries, lack thereof. Okay. In dysfunctional families of origin, there are no boundaries, none. And they teach us that it's not okay for us to have boundaries, or they teach us that it's okay for us to ever overrun other people's boundaries. So boundaries, again, is a self-esteem thing. If you have good self-esteem, y'all got good boundaries because you don't let just any Tom, Dick, or Harry come running over your boundary. You don't. So you got to work on self-esteem. And you don't have to be up in everybody else's business. So in enmeshed families, this is what we call it. It's enmeshed. So, you know, here's the family and it's, they're all up in everybody else's business, right? So that's not healthy either. Boundaries are a good thing. Having privacy is a good thing. Having your own thing is a good thing. But what abusers do is they tell us and they teach us very quickly, don't you dare have boundaries because I want to use you. That is basically what they are doing. So people that have got good boundaries, abusers can't abuse because boundaries are up and the word no is on the lips, you know? So this is what happens when we come out of an abusive family, a toxic family, a dysfunctional family, is that we don't even know what boundaries are. So this is where writing your list of deal breakers is going to help you develop boundaries. What will you not put up with? And if you find yourself having a hard time saying no to anything, this is a self-esteem issue because people who love themselves do not put up with abuse. They don't put up with name calling. They don't put up with manipulation. They don't put up with abuse by proxy. They don't put up with, you know, anything that's going to harm them. So you want to get with a good therapist and work on self-esteem and start developing the word no. Now, when we first start saying no, guess what the abuser is going to do? They are going to abuse more. Why? Because we've stood up to them. Because we've said no. Because we've drawn a boundary and we said, no, you may not cross that. And then they start pushing, 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 pushing. And that, unfortunately, is when you have to go, well, not unfortunately, but that is when you have to be like, okay, that's a, down, that's a boundary breaker. That's a deal breaker. Goodbye. And be done. Be done. Are you done being abused? People who push your boundary are abusive. People who harm you are abusive. Are you done? Be done. Be done. You can say no to people. And if the people don't respect or like the fact that you're saying no, guess what? They're not your tribe. They are not. They are not your people. Be done. Be done. So boundaries are huge. And abusers don't like the word no. And they don't like boundaries. And they don't like it when you start discovering who you really are. And this is when they'll start really attacking you personally. This is when they do the personal attacks. This is when they do the name calling. This is when they do the devaluing. This is when they do, because they see that you're starting to gain a sense of self and they don't want us to have a sense of self because once we get a sense of self, we don't want the abuse. So <clears throat> boundaries are huge and Abusers look for people who have none. They go after them because they know that they're easily manipulated. So this is why it's really, really, really important that if your family of origin was toxic, dysfunctional, harmful, codependent, addiction, mental illness, you know, somebody was always caretaking somebody else, you've got to work on your self-esteem and you've got to work on boundaries because otherwise... Any abuser out there is going to go, do, 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 do. oh, look, you, you know, so there that is. So that is one thing that happens to us. Okay, emotional numbness. Okay, yes, this also happens when we come out of abusive families. Hang on just a second. Okay, so emotional numbness. So what happens in toxic dysfunctional families 
is that we, the kids, very quickly learn that no emotion is allowed except for happy. That's it. That's We can't express anger. We can't express sadness. We can't express fear. We can't express confusion. We can't express anything because those fuckers will go for the jugular. Absolutely. As soon as we show weakness in any way, shape, or form, they come at us. If we're angry, guess what they do? I'll give you something to be angry about. Whap. Um, if we're sad, oh, what a little pussy you are. You're such a weak little bitch. Blah, 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 blah. You know, again, going for the emotional jugular. If we're confused, that's when they gaslight. Um, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's never safe to have any other emotion other than everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Everything's great. You're the best parent ever. Oh, my God. You know, seriously. So when we come out of dysfunctional families or a fucked up toxic relationship or a fucked up toxic work situation, we often don't recognize our own emotions because it's never been okay for us to have any and we become numb and that's not what we want. That is so not what we want. So what I suggest for people coming out of a toxic family, toxic anything, abusive anything, and you're having a hard time recognizing your own emotions, expressing your own emotions, feeling your own emotions, like there's a non-permission. Like some people will literally come in and sit on my couch and be like, I cannot cry. Oh boy, recognize that one. So tell me more. And then what it turns out is, is they got punished when they cried or they got yelled at or hit or whatever. And so it's making it safe to have the emotion. So that means that you have to give yourself permission to have emotions. You have to give yourself permission to cry and you do it in a safe place. Or you have somebody that you can trust to be with, to comfort you when you are crying. It's usually a therapist. Um, you know, and you start there and allow yourself to have emotions in the therapy room, but then take it out and start doing it in your real world. Now, here's a clue. If anybody makes you wrong for having an emotion and tells you you cannot have it, they're not your tribe. They're not your people. Get the fuck away from them. They're controlling their manipulative, their fear, obligation, and guilt. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Be done. Be done. You have a right to your emotions. Now, you do not have a right to take your emotions out on other people. Like, you don't get to rage at other people. That's not okay. You can be angry, you know, and you can say, I am angry. I am feeling angry. I feel angry when this event happens. That's perfectly okay because that's what you're feeling. It is not okay, however, to go you, 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 and then go Bruh! and roar and rage at the person. That is not okay. So in order to start identifying emotions, what I did when I was a kid is I would put on the saddest music I possibly could. I really did because it wasn't safe for me to cry because my dad would beat the shit out of me. So what I would do is I would put on really, really sad music and I would just, you know, in my apartment and I would allow myself to just cry. Or if I was angry, I allowed myself to have an absolute temper tantrum by myself. It took a long time to be able to, you know, have emotions in front of other people because it took a long time to trust that and to make sure that I was not harming somebody else because I did not want to do to another living person what my parents did to me. So, so you start by you, with you, in your own space, safe, expressing and experiencing emotions. The other thing, watching movies. Oh, dear God, if I watch any movie with a dog, guarantee you I will be crying. So, you know, it's like binge movies, for example. Um, you know, it's like that type of stuff. Allow yourself to start feeling. And then you, you slowly start transferring that over to, it's okay for me to feel sad about what's happened to me. So sometimes it's easier to feel sad about what's happened to a fictional character. Oh dear God, where the red fern grows. What a disaster. Holy crap. I fell apart in fourth grade. Jesus. Anyway, the point being is you start working on that and you allow the emotion and you allow the feeling and you allow you know, whatever it is, is going on as long as you're not harming somebody else and you give yourself permission. So again, it's the mirror work. You look in the mirror and you say, hi, I give you permission to have whatever feeling you're feeling because it's valid. It's your perception is your perception and it's okay. But what abusers do is they go, you're not feeling this. Oh, I can't tell you the number of really bad parents that I've seen in stores that the kid will be, um, you know, melting down. You know, they're two, they're three. They're tired. They're hungry. The kid will start fussing or crying or being angry or whatever. 
And the parent will say something along the lines of, no, you're not feeling that. What? Y yeah, they are. <laughs> they're, they're feeling it intensely with their entire little body, you know, so they don't validate it. They tell them, no, you're not feeling that. No, you don't want that. Well, yeah, they do. They just can't have it right now. You explain to them why you don't invalidate what they're feeling. You say, yes, I understand you want the candy. No, you can't have it right now. And yes, I understand you're angry because you are, and you're still not getting the candy. So, you know, the, a good parent does that. A bad parent invalidates and says, you're not feeling this. You don't want that. I'll tell you what to think. I'll tell you what you want. I'll tell you when it's okay to have emotions. And for an abuser, it's never okay. So the kid very quickly learns, oh, I, I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know what I'm thinking. I don't know what, I don't know what I want, you know? So they come out of these, we come out of these dysfunctional families and we literally don't know what we want. We don't because we've been told our whole life what to think, what to feel and what we want. And it's all for the abuser's benefit. So this is why working on your self-esteem, working on the mirror work, working on permission to feel, getting a, a, an emotion chart is huge. You know, when I worked in the, in the homeless shelter, a lot of the guys in there and the gals couldn't recognize an emotion if it walked up and did the Watusi with them because of the abuse that they went through when they were kids. So I started handing out emotion charts. And the cutest thing that happened was this ginormous man, six foot five, big bruiser, right? Um, he had a huge drug issue and he can, he was getting clean and sober. And it was pretty cool. He walks in and I said, well, you know, what are you feeling today? And he looks at the chart. And he's like, I feel demure. <laughs> Like, oh my God, this is the cutest thing ever. And I said, well, tell me what demure is. And he described it. So he'd been doing his homework. So he was practicing having different emotions. And for him, it was fun because he'd never been allowed to have demure or sad or, you know, scared. You know, any of the softer emotions were not okay because he would get the living shit beaten out of them. So anyway, emotion charts are great. You can find them on the internet. Practice. Practice different emotions. How do they feel? Where do you feel them in your body? How do you know when you're getting angry? It's part of the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Anger is part of that because remember, it's always rooted in fear of being hurt. So in your body, how do you know you're getting angry? You know? So for me, obviously the cortisol hits and I start tensing up because I get ready to fight. I'm a fighter. I don't flee. I fight. So, and then I feel my, my, you know, the red go all the way up my face, you know? So that's how I know I'm either going to have a panic attack or I'm going to go into a real bad anger. So figure out where you feel these things in your body with sadness. Some people feel it in the lump in their throat. Some people feel it in their gut. Where do you feel your emotions? They always manifest in our body. And that's the other thing. We get completely and totally disconnected from our bodies when we are with abusers because we're not allowed to feel. We're not allowed to, you know, where am I feeling this? Where is the emotion? Where in my body is it? I'm not allowed to express it. I'm not allowed to feel it. I'm not even allowed to acknowledge it. So now is the time to start acknowledging and feeling. Where do you feel your emotions in your body? Where do you feel each emotion in your body? And it'll manifest in different places, okay? So work on that. This is all part of self-esteem. This is all part of getting to know who you are after having been raised by abusive parents. So there is that. Okay. I'm going to go to questions here pretty quick. Hang on. There's a couple other things I want to hit on. Um, avoidance and anger. Okay. So since we're up to that avoidance and anger. So if we have had a narcissist for a parent, malignant, okay. Dark triad, right? They avoid, if they're not assured success, they're not even going to try it. Or if they're so arrogant, they'll try it once. And then when they realize they're not going to win, then they quit. So they quickly teach the kids to also give up. So um, here's the thing, though. It's like you got to know when to cut your losses, but you also got to know when to stick with it. And that is something that you have to work on with self-esteem and trusting your gut. So this kind of goes back to the whole nobility thing. You know, it's like we quickly learn, oh, my gosh, I have to take care of this person. And I'm noble if I'm staying with this person that nobody likes. No, you're being abused. But then it's like, okay, well, am I quitting to save myself, which would be a good thing? Am I quitting because this person's an abuser? Yes, that would be a good thing. Um, you know, am I avoiding situations? Am I avoiding taking that job because I'm afraid what my abuser will say? That's avoidance. If you're not doing something because you're afraid of what your abuser will say, 
you are practicing avoidance and that's not healthy. So you want to get with a good therapist and start working on trusting your gut and following your instincts and, and leaving abusive relationships, obviously. But, um, we do that. And then with anger. So remember in abusive households, especially with addiction, anger is the only emotion that's allowed to be expressed. And it's the only emotion that can be expressed by the abuser themselves. We're not allowed to express it. So we learn by watching them how anger is expressed and it's usually rage and it's usually all over everybody. So there's a lot of habits that we learn from our dysfunctional families that we have got to undo because I'll tell you what, nobody I know is going to put up with being screamed at if they have good self-esteem. Nobody I know is going to put up with, you know, constantly nagging or putting people down or negative Nellies or anything like that. And we learn all of that from our abusive families. So the way to undo these bad habits. So like, one of the bad habits that I picked up with from my mom, my mom was, you know, always, always in a panic about everything. And I used to do that. I used to be in a panic about it. And now I'm just like, whatever, if it's not bleeding, it's fine. So, you know, I mean, so she taught me to be panicky about everything. And I had to learn not everything is a DEF com one, you know, not everything is a, Oh my God, pull out the national guard emergency. So again, it's stuff that we've learned. So how do you start working in that? You journal it. You recognize when it's a problem, when people have pointed it out to you. Okay, this is what I'm doing. Is this something, is this a behavior I want to keep? No, it's not. Okay, well, what's going on in my mind? What do I feel like when I feel panicky? What do I feel like when I'm, I'm anxious about stuff? Who did I learn that from? And then you start undoing it and you catch yourself in the moment and you stop and you reframe and you keep going. And you learn that it's okay to not be panicky. Does that make sense? All right. I want to dive into questions because I'm pretty sure we've got a whole bunch of questions coming up now. Okay. Sometimes the abuse seems so subtle and hard to pinpoint when it happens that I don't know if it's just in my head. How can you tell when you're emotionally abused? All right. So it depends on the abuser. So the overt ones are obvious. You know, they, they do the real obvious stuff. The covert ones are passive aggressive. So they say things with plausible deniability. <laughs> so here's, here's the thing. How do you feel when you are around them? Do you feel lifted up? Do you feel encouraged? Do you feel happy? Do you feel like you could take on the world? If you don't, you're with an abuser because abusers drain us. They make us exhausted. It is it's like a hit and run fuck you is what I call it. So what a, what a covert abuser does is they come in and they say something really nasty, really passive aggressive, and then boom, they're gone. And then we're left sitting there going, did that just happen? Did it, Am I misinterpreting this? Because that, that sure sounded like a fuck you. Do you see where I'm going? And that's what they do. They do hit and run fuck yous. And it's covert and it's sneaky and it's passive aggressive. So what you're going to watch and you're going to listen to is your gut. How do you feel around this person? Do you feel good around them? Yes or no? Quick answer. Remember, the head and the heart will tell you a bunch of bullshit. It'll tell you a story. Well, yes, but. Well, no, but. And let me tell a story. But la, 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 la. The gut is a simple yes or no answer to a yes or no question. Do you feel good around this person after they leave? Yes or no? Go with that. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Your gut will not steer you wrong. The head will steer you wrong. The heart will steer you wrong. The gut will not steer you wrong. So there is that. Okay. Hope that answered the question. Um, you, you always trust how you feel around them. Do you feel happy, enlightened, can't wait to see them again? Then that's a good relationship. If you feel drained, if you feel icky about yourself, if you're questioning if you're a good person or not, if you're feeling like, ew, I just, ew, I got slimed, but I don't know how, then you got slimed. Trust that. So see how you feel around the person. If you feel good around them, then you're not being abused. If you feel like shit around them after they've left, you know, and you're second guessing yourself, then it's abuse. Absolutely. And, and look to see what the passive aggressiveness is. Absolutely. What was the passive aggressive thing they said? Think about it. Write it down. Work it through. Who else does that in your life? Hmm, that type of thing. So there's that. Um, how do you get over the sad realization that you have been in, in the fog for a lifetime? Well, you reframe it, first of all. So yes, when I realized that my family was a batshit crazy, 
it was extremely upsetting and it was extremely disheartening. And it was the inner child mourning, like wailing, like, why can't I have a normal family? Why can't I have a normal mom and dad? Why did I get set up for dysfunctional relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So there is going to be that mourning period. Okay. And it is disheartening and it is sad and it is everything else. But then you kind of go, thank God, I see it. Holy, whoa, I see it. I have been in the fog. And now that I see it, I don't have to be in the fog one second longer. You see where I'm going with that? You never allow yourself to stay stuck. So here's the deal. <clears throat> you acknowledge the grief. You acknowledge the sadness. You acknowledge the anger. You feel your feelings and then you free yourself. You revel in the fact that you can see it now. You can see it and you can get rid of all of those toxic relationships. Hang on just a second. So in these toxic relationships that we have surrounded ourselves with, we can now see the abusers for what they are and we can see the toxicity for what it is. How amazing is that? Seriously. And now you have the power to go, hmm, this person's toxic, that person's toxic. I am going to let this one die by attrition. I am going to actually just be done. I'm, see where I'm going with this. You start cleaning out your friend closet, your family closet, because not all family is blood. Not all family is blood. This is why I go through and I start setting up little support groups everywhere I go because not all family is blood. Family are the people who cheer for you and are your cheerleaders and go, go you, you've got this. Be awesome. Be the best you you can be. Those are your tribe. Those are your people. So you start getting rid of all of the toxic people. Thank God you can see it now. Did it suck that you were in the fog for a lifetime? Fuck yeah, mourn it. Write a grieving letter. Write a grieving letter. Dear little interior child, dear, dear little inner child, I am so sorry that you and I had to be in the fog for a lifetime. That sucks. I'm sorry, but let's put it back on the abusers. And guess what? Now we're free. Now we're free. Now we see. Now we can do something. Now we can move forward. And it's never too late. Not as long as there is breath in the body. It is never too late. So don't you ever start getting stuck in that thinking where it's like, oh, I'm too old. No, fuck that shit. You're not too old. I didn't get my master's degree until I was in my late 30s. I didn't write my first book until I was 45. I am going to turn 54 next week. I travel the world. I do all sorts of fun stuff. I do not allow my family, either the ghost of them or the real them, keep me down in any way, shape, or form. I don't. I mourn what happened, absolutely, and then I move the fuck forward. So, And that's what we got to do because otherwise the fuckers win. Don't allow the fuckers to win. Boom. There we go. Okay. Where was I? Uh, I was told to always kiss my parents goodnight, even though I was abused by my dad. Oh, I'm 29 years old and I still struggle with not showing affection after abuse or a fight. How do I get past this? Well, first of all, you get out of the abuse or a fight. Um, so abusers, what they're doing when they do that, they are soothing their own ego and I see abusive parents do this all the time. They will abuse, abuse, abuse. And then, oh, give mommy a kiss. Oh, give daddy a kiss. Oh, you know, tell me how much you love me. I'm sorry. You just beat the shit out of me. And you want me to tell you how much I love you? So do you see where I'm going with that? So this is what abusers do. And it is part of the intermittent positive rewards. It is trauma bonding. Trauma bonding. Okay. So what abusers do is they abuse, 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 and then comfort, abuse, 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 and then comfort. And that is the trauma bonding. That is the intermittent positive rewards. And that's what we get addicted to the motherfuckers. So that is trauma bonding. So you don't have to put up with abuse at all. If you're mad at somebody, you're mad with somebody. If somebody has been abusive to you, be the fuck done. Do not go back. Oh my God. God, please, for your own safety, don't go back to it. Now, in arguing in a, in a relationship, and this is what I like to say when I'm working with couples, couples do have disagreements, but they don't have fights. Let me just say that again. Couples have disagreements, but they don't have fights. 
They don't. In a healthy, normal relationship, you can have opposing opinions and not agree and have a disagreement and work it through and still not be fighting. I know. In our model for fighting or having a disagreement in our dysfunctional families is generally that if there is a disagreeing opinion, there was a knockdown, drag out fight, and there was abuse, and there was screaming, and there was yelling, and there was, you will see it my way, period. Okay, that's not healthy. That's not normal. That is not how real people behave. That is how abusers behave. So abusers always have fights, always. Name calling, putting the other person down, you're wrong, I'm right, black and white thinking, hello, we just talked about that. That's what goes on in fights because there's black and white thinking. In a healthy, normal relationship, you want to understand where your partner's coming from and your partner, more importantly, wants to figure out where you're coming from. Well, not more importantly, but you know what I'm saying? It's like the two of you are a team on the same side trying to get your calls together for the play. So you're on the same team. You're trying to understand each other and where you are coming from. And then you find a mutually satisfactory agreement. That is what healthy couples do. It's not one person always being right and the other one always being put down, you know, the one up kind of thing. It's not that. And it's not knocked down screaming. It's understanding, understanding. Okay, I heard you say blah, 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 blah. I don't agree with it. How can we come to a mutually agreeable, you know, into this? Okay, so you're right. I don't agree with it. Um, what do you think about this? You know, and then you go back and forth and you negotiate. That is what healthy, normal couples do. They don't fight. They disagree. Absolutely. John and I do have disagreements, but we don't scream at each other. We don't, you know, whenever there is a disagreement, immediately both of us are like, let me understand where you're coming from. So I make sure that I'm hearing you correctly. So we learn from watching toxic families that, that disagreeing means fighting. And it's not. It, nah. In healthy, normal relationships, disagreeing means disagreeing and then finding a mutually acceptable resolution. So again, read all you can on self-esteem. Read all you can on healthy relationships. And somebody has asked me to write a book on healthy relationships, and that is in the works, but I've got to get my other book done first. So um, anyway, there is that. So um, abuse and then demanding that you give a kiss is trauma bonding. It is. And you don't have to give a kiss to anybody. You don't. You know, if you don't feel like being physically affectionate with somebody, you don't have to be physically affectionate with somebody. Why? Because it's your body. It's your body and you have the right, you know. Now, you want to be careful that you're not stonewalling and that you're not punishing. So, you know, it's you got to really be you got to have a come to Jesus with yourself and is, is and be like, am I stonewalling? Am I punishing? Or is this like, no, I'm not going to kiss you right now. You just called me a bitch. So not interested. You, do you see where I'm going with that? There's a difference. So you got to be careful of that. And you got to work through it. I would strongly suggest get with a good therapist, work on the trauma, work on the trauma, work on boundaries, work on self-esteem. Okay. So Glenn Schraldi's The Self-Esteem Workbook, absolutely important. CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Get it, read it, work it. Um, journal, you know, journal it, journal it out. You do not need to participate in trauma bonding. You do not. So get with a good therapist and start working on that. Um, okay, I've made the break with my narcissistic abusive mother and I am no longer in contact, but I feel guilty that I've abandoned her. How do I get past these feelings? If you were not related to these people, would you have anything to do with them? If the answer is no, act accordingly. If people wanted to be taken care of in their old age, they should not have been fucking abusers. Pretty simple. So yes, are you going to be trained to have guilt? Yes, you are. By who? Huh. By the abuser. For their own benefit. So this stuff was set up in your head years ago. Get with a good therapist. Work on self-esteem. Work on boundaries. Work on why you are not having contact with this person anymore. Write a list of all the rotten things this person ever did to you and put it somewhere where you can see it. Stop playing the guilt game. It is a game. It is a game. Fear, obligation, and guilt 
It is a game. If you are feeling any of these, it is not a healthy relationship and you are under no obligation to take care of these people. You're not. And you know, it's so funny. Every single time I, I say this, I get a whole bunch of abusers going, fuck you. They should be honoring the mother and the father. And the very next line in the Bible says, parents do not bring your children to anger, you fucking assholes. So you know what? Okay. It doesn't say fucking assholes, but the point I'm trying to make is it's a two-way street. If you, <laughs> There's also a meme that says, if you'd wanted me to write nice things about you, you probably shouldn't have acted like an asshole. So it's the same thing. If somebody is abusive, you owe them nothing. Nada. Goose egg. Nothing. They have their own karma to deal with. And their own karma is they get to die alone. Have fun with that. You've treated people like shit. You're going to die alone. Have fun with that. You're going to be in an old age home. Nobody's going to want to see you. When my mom was in the care facility, because she got to the point where she wasn't able to take care of herself. She was 80. She died when she was 89. So when she was there, there were a lot of old narcissists there. It was sad to watch. And they would snap their fingers at the staff and they would demand this and demand that. And when the family did come to visit them, all they did was guilt trip them for not being there every single day. You know, and eventually the family stopped visiting, you know. So, again, it's kind of like if you want people to be around you, be a person that people want to be around. It's pretty simple. So you are under no obligation, sweetheart. If you are feeling guilty, I suggest you write a goodbye letter and figure out the guilt and let it the fuck go. You owe them nothing. You owe them nothing. If parents were abusive, you owe them diddly fucking squat. Okay. Nothing. You owe them zip zero zilch, nada. So go live your life. Go be awesome. You have nothing to feel guilty about. So get with a good therapist to work on that because you don't owe them anything. So, you know, that was the one thing my dad always said is like, well, you know, I, you know, I brought you into this world. I could take you out of this world. And I'm like, I'm not the asshole who didn't wear a condom, you know, X number of years ago. So fuck you. You know, they do that. They try to make us feel obligated because we came into the world. And you know what? That's <laughs> having sex does not qualify you as a parent. Sorry. A parent is somebody who grows their child up. Somebody who is supportive, somebody who is loving, somebody who is kind, somebody who's tough when they need to be, but always explains to the child why. Somebody who is a support, somebody who has got their six, somebody who's got their back, and you know it like the sun comes up in the east. And if you do not have your child's back like that, you do not deserve your child. And fuck you, asshole, you deserve to die alone. There it is. So, all right. I hope that answered that question. Um, so how do I deal with the silent treatment that my dad is giving me as a punishment? You go no contact. It, yeah. And okay. So they're punishing you. So do healthy, normal parents do that? No, they most certainly do not. They do not do the silent treatment. They do not punish the child by not talking to them. They do not punish the child for not jumping as high as they want when they say jump. You know, I mean, it's, it's no healthy, normal people. How do you deal with it? You move on with your life and you go no contact. Honestly, it's like, are you, here's the question. Are you happy when you're around them? Do you feel fulfilled when you're around them? Are you supported when you're around them? Do they love you when you're around them? Do you feel good when you're around them? Do you feel good when you're not around them? If you were not related to these people, would you have anything to do with them? And if the answer is no, act accordingly. Your life will be ever so much better. Trust me on that one. They are making choices and they are making bad choices. Let them live with the consequences. And the consequence is they don't get to be around you. They don't. You know, you wouldn't put up with that treatment from a stranger. You know, if somebody at work started pulling that shit, would you put up with that? If a stranger, you know, tried to punish you, would you put up with that? The answer to that is no. So why the fuck are you letting your family do it? Don't. Don't. All right. Um, I don't really know what to do when the mother of my daughter treats me verbally and brutally in front of my daughter. I'm afraid and so confused. How should I respond in front of my daughter? You gray rock you gray rock. So what you're going to teach your daughter is gray rock. So I don't know how old your daughter is, 
But whenever an abuser, and especially in a divorce situation, you do not, do not want to respond in kind because that is exactly what the abuser is attempting to get you to do. Why? Because then they can say, ah, oh, this person did this in front of our son or our daughter and look what a horrible parent they are. And they usually pull out their phone and video record it. So what you want to do is you gray rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you use some of their own stuff against them. Oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> sorry, that one made me laugh because it just sends them through the roof. So remember, a narcissistic apology is one in which the narcissist goes, I'm sorry you, I'm sorry but, you made me do this, I'm sorry you feel this way, I'm sorry but I did this because you did. So what you do is you give them a taste of their own medicine in that case, but you gray rock it, meaning there is no emotional response. They're poking the bear. They want you to respond in kind. They want you to come unglued. They want you to fight. They want you to argue. Hello, dysfunction. Hello. So they do that and they're hoping that you're going to rise to the bait. Do not rise to the bait. So what you're going to do is gray rock. So gray rock is where you give them absolutely no emotional response whatsoever. No anger, no sadness, no nothing. It's just straight on. Huh? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Look at the time. Yeah. I'm sorry you feel that way. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm, Got to go. That's it. No emotional response. Not happy, not sad, not anything. It's going to give them nothing. Is it going to make them escalate? Absolutely. You let them take themselves down with their own energy. So eventually what ends up happening with abusers that do that is they will do something so egregious and they get caught doing it. So you probably, you yourself want to have your video cam on your phone going or your video recorder, check with the local laws, see if you can tape without the other person knowing in Arizona, you can, I do not know about other States. So check with the local laws, but yeah, in, in Kung Fu, the concept is an enemy will usually have anger behind them. Right. And it's, I'm going to sound like Star Wars here, but anger is the, is the dark side. Anger will take you down to destruction. If you are battling an enemy, you want to be as logical and crystal clear as you possibly can. Do not allow your anger to engage. That's why you go gray rock. Okay. So what ends up happening in Kung Fu is an enemy comes at you, right? And they're all, and I'm going to get you. And, rah, 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 rah. and then they, here they are coming at you, coming at you, coming at you. Whoop, get out of the way. Boom. You let them take themselves down with their own energy, with their own, you know, momentum. Okay. That's what Kung Fu is all about is you use your enemy's momentum against them. You know, you just, you let them do it, but you don't let them do it to you. You step out of the way and let them do it. Um, or when you're grappling, same thing. You allow their anger to make them make mistakes. So with gray rocking, you're giving them nothing, absolutely nothing. So they're going to ramp up. Why aren't you responding to me? You know, and guess who's going to look crazy in the eyes of the child? Not you. So you gray rock, you gray rock, you just gray rock. And you document the fucking shit out of it. And if you can get it on tape and it's legal, do it. So there is that. Um, I, you know, and you can also say, you know, this is not a good thing to be saying in front of our daughter. If you have a problem with me, this should be said in private or you can send it to me in an email. So here's the other thing. When you are dealing with custody issues with an abuser, you try to get everything in writing. Okay. It's like texting or email. Do not take phone calls. Do not meet with them privately. It's like, you know, uh, I'm sorry, so-and-so, but you know, if you want to discuss this, how about you send me an email? That'll piss them off, you know, and there it is done. You're not going to respond. And, and you're going to have to be a broken record because they're going to keep trying because they're crazy. So remember, the definition of insanity is doing the same fucking thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. And this is what they do. Abusers are predictable. Like, I can't tell you the number of people who have written in in recent weeks. It's been really awesome. Letting me know that they're okay. Letting me know that their court case has turned out all right, that they got a good attorney that represented them and fought for them. And oh my God, Chris. You're absolutely right. They did exactly what you've been saying they would do during a custody battle. I knew what to expect. We won. It was good. But oh my God, it's like they have a playbook. Yeah, they do. They all do the exact same things. They don't, because of the rigid thinking, because of the black and the white, they can't maneuver. They don't have flexibility. So gray rock gives you flexibility and it forces them into a very black and white position, which will cause them to spin out of control, which will cause them to do something even worse in front of the kid, which will not look good in front of the courts. So there it is. 
I hope that answered the question. Um, you just, you agree right. This is not a time or a place. If you want to send this to me in an email, do that. See, no emotion, no emotion, no emotion. Not a good idea to be saying this in front of the kid. Mm -hmm. All right, gotta go. Don't sit there and take it. Cut it off. You don't have to stand there and listen to them. You owe them nothing. If you're divorced or if you're in the middle of a divorce, you don't have to sit there and listen to their bullshit. You take the kid and you go, you know, have a nice day. Bye. Do you see where I'm going with that? Yeah. Are they going to escalate? Yeah. Are they going to ramp up? Yeah. Are they going to do something stupid? Yeah. And that's when you got them. So, and make sure everything is in writing. It's like, encourage them. Hey, email me. Hey, you don't like what I'm doing? Email me. Put it in writing. Yep, that's what you want to do. Okay, um, why would an abusive parent object to their child taking care of themselves? Is it jealousy or something else? Well, let's think about it. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're vulnerable to manipulation. So hang on just a second. Hold on. Okay, so abusers want us at our lowest possible point, okay? Because if we're exhausted... If we're not getting enough sleep, because remember, a lot of abusers love to wake people up to keep them from sleeping, to keep them from resting, to keep them from eating healthy. They will either overfeed or underfeed. Um, they will, uh, you know, encourage you to work yourself into an early grave, uh, you know, that kind of thing. If you're constantly in a state of exhaustion and your adrenal gland is constantly in, you know, oh my God mode, oh my God mode, oh my God mode you're not going to have the time or the energy to resist or fight what they're pulling. So you're more malleable. You are easily manipulated if you are not doing self-care. So that is why they do that. Now, some parents and mine did this. If I made them look good, oh dear God, he claimed me and I was just like the best kid ever. And I talk about it in this book. Hello, what's wrong with your dad? So, um, yeah, he would claim me and, oh, look how wonderful she is. But if I didn't make him look good, it was like I didn't exist, you know, and, and that's when I got the whole, oh, you're the, you're the cute one. You're not the smart one. And I'm just like, fuck you. So, you know, it's like that thing. So they want us to not do self-care because if we're exhausted, we're more easily manipulatable. My dad would wake everybody up at five o'clock in the morning with a goddamn chainsaw every fucking weekend. It's like, Jesus Christ, dude, we don't have that many trees. So, but he would, he would do stuff that would, you know, start mowing the lawn, you know, things like that. It's like, can we, any of us just get some sleep for just one fucking hour? Oh my God. And if we slept past six, we were lazy. We were this, we were that, we were the other thing. And it's a way for the abuser to keep the person, the target of abuse in a constant state of exhaustion, constant state of, of PTSD, constant state of, Oh my God, Oh my God, Oh my God. And more malleable, more malleable, because then we're going to try to appease the abuser in order to get them to leave us the fuck alone. So that's what the, that's what that game is all about. So that's why they don't want us to take care of ourselves. It is jealousy in part. It is um, it is a way to keep us more malleable. Absolutely. And, and I've seen abusers too. You know, like when the son or daughter grown up does something nice for themselves, the mom or the dad comes and says, "Well, you should have bought me this." What? The, what? So yeah, you will have adult children of dysfunctional families having the dysfunctional families tell them that they need to be dumping all their money into the family because they bore you They're, You know, they, they, they brought you into this world. And so you owe us son, you owe us daughter. So yeah, they do that. And you just got to be like, fuck no, thank you. Bye-bye. You know? So yeah, they do that. They absolutely do that. A lot of abuse is money related, especially with BPD and NPD. So um, yeah. It's gold diggers. Yeah. So if the daughter or son does well, you will see that family, that original family of origin come back and start blackmailing them emotionally for them to give them money. So yeah, that happens too. Um, so that's why they tell us not to take care of ourselves because we're more easily manipulated. Uh, question. My dad is an abuser, maybe BPD. My mom is in denial and my sister is extra anger, angry. How do I set boundaries when I am the peacemaker and the one that solves the issues between everyone? You stop. You stop. You resign. Not your job. Last time I checked, you're not working for the UN. Stop being the diplomat. Stop. You cannot fix these people because you did not break these people. It is not your job. The next time they start in on it, walk out. It's not your job. 
It's not your job. Quit. Resign. In fact, you might want to write a resignation letter and burn it. So, uh, dear family, I hereby resign as the UN peacekeeper because, you know, the pay sucks and there's no benefits. So I quit. And while we're at it, fuck all of you and goodbye. And then trot it out to the barbecue and burn it and let it go. It's not your job. It's not your job. It's the adult's job to stop being fucking assholes. And if they can't or they won't, it's not your job. Does that make sense? So anyway, that is it. Okay, we are at 104. I think I'm going to call it good for today. Next week, I am going to have Susanna Quintana on. She is going to discuss her new book, which I'm so excited about. We're going to talk about what it's like to be a single parent uh, raising kids when you're dealing with uh, an abusive ex. And then the week after that, because of popular demand, I am going to be talking about sex as a weapon. So we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about how abusers use the sex to hook people, and then how they go into withdrawal afterwards, and what that does to us. Okay, so next week, Susanna Quintana. The week after, sex is a weapon. That's my evil plan. Um, reminder. Uh, oh, 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 yes. Please share these videos. If you know anybody that is going through any sort of abuse in any way, shape, or form, share, 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 share. Please feel free to refer people to my books. I've got a book list um, posted on Facebook um, for any of the books that I have mentioned. Um, oh, <laughs> So we're thinking of selling a, a paperweight. That it's a gray rock and it says go gray rock on it. So let us know if you're interested in that. Um, uh, let's see. Let me know. Let my manager know, Chris, at mercury.com. So it's C-H-R-I-S at M-U-R, C-U-R-I.com, mercury, M-U-R-C-U-R-I.com, where you want me to show up next. I know some people have said, please show up on the east side of LA. I know some people in Rancho Cucamonga wanted me to be there. So let me know what city you want me to come to. And um, that's it. Love seeing you guys. I do. And I love setting up the support groups. It makes me so happy. All right, my loves, go be awesome. Go have a wonderful week. Um, journal, take good care of yourselves, practice self-care, and I will talk to you next week with Susanna Quintana. All right. Have a great week, guys. Bye.